tonight's virtual parenting workshop. Uh, this event is hosted by the Community Connections team at Westminster United Church in Tempsford. We are very happy to have Joe McPherson with us tonight to share some strategies for peaceful parenting. And should we wonder at her skills of this, she has raised four children. She has been a teacher. She has a degree in child psychology from the University of Guelph and a Bachelor of Education from Brock. So she comes well qualified for this. Now that we're a few weeks into the third lockdown, we feel that the topic is so important to provide support to caregivers, children, and their families. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat or wait until the question period at the end for Jill. This workshop will be recorded and posted to our YouTube channel for others to watch if they couldn't make it online. And we ask that if you do want to watch it online, that you register so we can keep track of numbers and make sure that we get to the link to the YouTube site. Without further ado, we're going to introduce Jill and have her tell whatever she has to tell us. Thank you, Jill. Great, thank you. All right, so since I'm screen sharing, I can only see a few boxes at a time. So um, what I'm gonna ask you to do that, if you do have a question, you can also ask throughout. Um, I decided that I would also place sort of question times throughout my presentation rather than waiting all at the end. Um, because if something comes up for you, um, I, I want to be able to address it you know, right away. So don't hesitate to, to ask questions. Um, so otherwise, uh, I'll, yeah, I'll just get started right into it. Um, so the main theme that I'm going to talk about tonight is just recognizing our triggers. Um, basically, when we're feeling frustrated or overwhelmed in the role of either parenting, grandparenting, caregiving, um, to, to figure out what's going on. So when I do online parenting workshops or I'm giving one-to-one -one support to a parent and they tell me about something that's bothering them, um, I'm going to share with you some steps we go through to sort of investigate how we can uh, deal with the challenge. Okay, so, so first of all, I'm going to invite a little bit of uh, uh, volunteer sharing. If you'd like to um, introduce yourself and perhaps describe one or two in one or two words um, to describe, oh, I'm sorry, I had a little typo there. Words to describe something that is triggering you right now. Um, and if you don't, if you can't think of something or even something say recently, you know, what's something where you remember the last time you were feeling impatient around a child, um, what was the triggering event? Does anybody want to be brave enough to, to volunteer something? I can volunteer something. I was phoned by a granddaughter one day and I knew that she was to make dessert for a meal and she hadn't done it. So I said to her, I said, well, let's just get busy. Rather than tell her that, you know, you, I said, you go to the kitchen and we put a, we got FaceTime on the go and she made the cake while I talked to her. Yeah. And it so, could have triggered me into something more. I just thought, no, I'm not going to lecture her because she knows. She's smart enough. Yeah. 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 So the trigger, it sounds like, was when something wasn't getting done that was supposed to be done. Is that yeah. what I'm hearing? Yeah, that was the trigger, and that happens quite often with teenagers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks for sharing. Anyone else want to share something? I will. Um, so we are undergoing um, some behavioral assessments for my son. Um, so his... Um, constant need to not listen, a constant need to like make noises and misbehave is kind of a, a trigger these days um, throughout um, our day and during school and stuff. So that's kind of where we are struggling right now for him. Okay, great. Yeah. So that feeling that he's not listening or not following direction, is that also what's happening for you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, great. Thank you. Anyone else want to share something? We share things on the um, upper level of children. My kid is uh, 16 and a half. Well, one of them is. And I'm struggling really hard with um, he has to leave for a certain time to go to work. And he doesn't. He, he is 
waiting. He's checking his phone. He's like tying up his shoes super slow. He waits two minutes before he has to leave. Like he, it only takes him two minutes to walk to work, but it's like he only waits until there's two minutes left until the time he's supposed to be there. So I'm triggering because I want him to be responsible. That's what we've taught him is to show up on time. Um, but lately, I just don't know how to not be on him, but show him still that it's, you know, what has to happen. So my trigger is just that he's not being as responsible as he should be. Right. Great. Thank you. Anyone else want to share something? Um, I'll give you a few more a minute if you want to, but I'll just share one uh, for me. So right now my children are um, are all home and they're um, 13, uh, 17, 19, and 21. Um, and the two older ones are home finishing up um, their post-secondary year uh, because of COVID. Um, so we're back to having four kids in the house. Um, and my um, set, the two older ones are responsible for their own cell phones and, and uh, payments once they were old enough to get a visa to be able to, to pay their phones. It's fine. But my 17-year-old um, is still paying me through my visa on her account. And one of my triggers has been that I would like her to commit to a day of the month that she's going to pay me for her phone bill um, rather than me asking each month for her to pay me. Um, so I've noticed that's been one of my triggers lately is I really, it's really important to me that she commit to a day of the month to pay the bill the way I have to pay, I'm committed to paying it on a certain day of the month. Um, so, so we all have our triggers. Um, you know, it's, they never go away, do they? They just, uh, it's just learning how to manage them more effectively and getting the skills to do that. Any other last ones before I move on? Okay. Um, so what I share is that we have a choice when we're triggered, when we're upset with our children, um, we can first try to find ways to change or fix our kids in order to feel better, which is sort of our default mode that, that most of us are in. Um, or we can use our parenting challenges to self-reflect and make positive changes within ourselves first. Um, and so this is really, really key um, because what, um, you know, which is likely going to be easier and more effective? Yeah, well, even... always dealing with ourselves is, is uh, an effective strategy for making positive lasting change, right? Yeah. So we're going to get into tonight how, how we can do that. So another thing to consider is what are the characteristics, characteristics for you for a great parent-child or grandparent-child relationship? What are some things that um, you think are important to have in that relationship? And we can just get maybe two or three ones if anyone just wants to shout out some characteristics. Be able to have fun together, laugh together, enjoy yeah. each other's company. Enjoy each other's yeah. company, yeah. Trust. We need to be able to trust the grandparents and, uh, and the parents. Yeah, a tr trusting relationship for sure. Great. And, and possibly a relationship where there's mutual respect um, and listening. Um, so those are things that um, characteristics that we want to, to build towards as we take an opportunity to self-reflect when we're triggered. Okay. So um, in order to create what we need or want in a relationship, we're going to build greater knowledge um, of, you know, things like child development, greater skills like communication skills and greater self-awareness. So when I'm teaching my online workshops, I keep referring to the parenting toolbox. So if I'm asking you to do a pretty big task like parenting or grandparenting, um, you're going to need quite a few tools. And if you have limited tools, there's limited projects, limited things you can do, right, and build. Like if I said to you, you know, I want you to fix something in my car and you only have a few tools like a hammer and a, and a screwdriver and pliers or something, you're pretty limited on what you can do. Uh, but if you are, have lots of tools, then you're far more equipped to deal with um, those big challenges. 
So what I do is walk uh, parents through different skills in particular. Um, and as I teach the skills, there's knowledge obviously that goes along with it, but teaching skills that they can use for more effective parenting. So one of the skills I teach is the observation versus judgment. Um, and there was once a great Indian philosopher that said observing without evaluation is the highest form of human intelligence and the reason that is is because we are um, for the most part in uh, judgment mind all the time I'm just going to ask if someone's not muted I can't mute you but if um, people could mute so that I so we don't hear that background um, that's great um, so for most of the time, we are in judgment mode. So people will say, I always chuckle when people say, um, you know, you shouldn't judge. Well, I know what they're saying. They're saying, don't take, um, you know, judgments and use them negatively against somebody. But as far as saying don't judge, that is, that is what our minds do all the time. We're looking around judging. Is this okay? Is this not? Is this person safe? Is this not? Um, is this okay to eat? Is it not? Um, and so we're constantly judging our environment for safety, for just um, for making you know, ideal choices. Um, so because of that, for us to not be in judgment mode, it takes uh, a very conscious effort to decide that we're not going to judge something but observe. And I'll tell you, explain why the skill is really great to build, uh, particularly with parenting. But first I'm gonna share with you, I'm gonna click on this link here to bring up another document I have that has examples of this that we're gonna walk through. So just waiting for it to pop up. So, um, I'm just going to share with you differences between evaluation or judgment statements versus observation in the exact same situation. So um, here's two uh, in the same situation. So Grayson doesn't take care of his, of his toys. That's an evaluation. An observation would be Grayson leaves his toys on the floor when he's done with them. So see, seeing doesn't care about his toys is uh, and a judgment, an evaluation, we, an assumption we've made about somebody, but we can't know that. That's something in their head. But what we can do is see that he leaves toys on the floor when he's done. That's an observation, right? So observation is what would I see here if I was in the room? Okay. Evaluation. Sarah is lazy. Or the observation would be uh, possibly, Sarah did not do the two things I just asked her to do. Katrina is such a picky eater. The observation would be Katrina will only eat bread, cheese, and pickles. He is so oppositional. The last three times I asked him to do, do something, he said no. So just start hearing the difference between the two, right? Zach was angry for no reason. Right. Zach threw his toys while screaming. Charlie is a good boy. Charlie puts his toys away. He was not asked. Sophia is very aggressive when things don't go her way. Sophia hit her brother when he took her blankie. Avery is so scattered. The last three times I asked Avery where his homework is, he said he didn't know. My son has anxiety. My, my son will start to cry and scream when I leave his bedroom at night. My daughter has no patience. Whenever I ask my daughter to wait, she screams. So if you can start to hear the difference, um, it's really important because when we're dealing with a triggering moment, we'll find that if we stop and when we stop and take the deep breath, one of the first things you'll notice is that you're in evaluation mode, that you've evaluated the situation um, in, a, in a negative, painful um, situation rather than observing what's really happening. Okay, now you might think, okay, so why? So let's just go a bit farther now and figure out why I'm sharing with you why I'm sharing this. So let's try it. So I have to keep moving my the faces around so I can see my own screen. Um, so let's try it. So if you think about something 
that where a triggering event, so you, you, you could even use a triggering event that you've already explained or offered, and you try stating that what happened as an observation rather than an evaluation. Then, um, and not saying what, what when you, anybody shared previously, which it was, but I'm just saying notice, if you think about a situation where, where you were upset uh, with a child, can you explain what happened or one uh, few seconds of what's, what was happening, what you saw as an observation statement rather than an evaluation statement? Does anyone wanna try? I'll start off by with my example with my with my daughter in the phone bill. So an evaluation statement would be um, she's so careless at, or she she doesn't care about uh, my feelings or my situation and with this uh, with paying her bill. You know, so that would be an evaluate evaluation where I'm deciding what I think she's thinking or her perception of the situation. Okay, an observation would be every month I need to remind Olivia to pay me for her phone bill. Okay. Does anybody want to try it? It's okay if not, but I'm just inviting you to see if you want to try to see the difference in your own mind about the situation. Can I ask a question, Joe? Yeah, sure. Great. It's kind of, I guess to me, I, I look at it as like kind of that all or nothing, like staying away from the, the polarizing side. It's almost like bias in some ways, right? You're like every person I see who does this is this when really it's like that one experience, this happened and now I'm projecting on everybody. Is that kind of the con same concept? Um, it can be, yeah. It's the idea that when we start being more aware of our own thinking, that's where the power lies, right? So if not, if we stay in judgment evaluation mode, then we keep thinking that it's the other person that this is the cause of my upset, right? And so, because we're just, we're looking outward all the time saying, if he just picked up his toys, if he wasn't late, if you know, she just, you know, stopped crying if blah, 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 you know, she was just more patient, whatever um, we're triggered about. And this goes with any relationship, not just a child, um, anybody in your life when you're triggered. Um, if we stay in our evaluation mind, chances are we'll keep looking outward at the person to believe that they are the cause of our upset. But if we can take a deep breath and start noticing when I'm triggered, what is it that I was like, what was I just thinking when I finally like flew off the handle or when I, you know, got uh, really angry? That's where we start to get become more, far more self-empowered. If we can start noticing what's our mental dialogue, what are we saying? Um, and often we can hear it outward. I mean, we, when you get really good at it and you hear yourself saying something out loud, you'll hear your, your own evaluation. And, um, and you'll be like, oh, you know, and, and that's it. There's strategies I teach uh, with this, but this is sort of like the first step of self uh, awareness is starting to notice what's your own mental dialogue. And what you'll start to notice is that your mental dialogue is often, <laughs> well, pretty much all the time, far more painful than the situation you're in. Right? Um, and, and you know this because you can be really, you know, having a down day or a down moment. Let's just use this for an example, because there's been probably more of them than usual during COVID. And you know that when you have shifted your thinking, you're suddenly um, feeling different. And yet you're still, you know, stuck at home or you're still in the, your reality didn't change. The only thing that changed was your thinking. Right. So it, so uh, what I do is help parents to start recognizing their their thought patterns and um, and addressing that. And, and often once we deal with, um, you know, the own your own thinking in your head, that's where uh, lots of changes can be made. And it, and it doesn't even involve the child. 
right? So, um, so this is a little a spot for another question break too. Um, sometimes it's kind of hard to process something like that. We need a little bit of time and sometimes questions come later. Um, so if anybody does have a question, even after the workshop, you can, you can email me. Um, I'll be giving contact information, but um, at this point anyway, does anyone have a question they want to, and I always say one of my favorite parts of a workshop or when I do a talk is what I call the yeah buts. Um, when people say, yeah, Jill, I know what you're talking about, but, and then they tell me a scenario that think where they think it, it may be the exception. And so, you know, or they, or they just, they want to get, they want to get on board with me, but they are, you know, blocked by something or they have another. And I love that. Some people think, oh, that's being difficult. Um, it's not at all. It's called learning. Um, so I, I love, yeah, but questions. So if you have one of them or just any question at all, um, please feel free to ask. I don't have a question, but I just an observation. I have three children, but I have a fourth child at home, and that's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very similar. I often think, you know, like I react, and then I think, oh no, I shouldn't have reacted because he's never going to listen to it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's kind of a, a human nature thing. Yeah, yeah, but um, you know, it's 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 totally yeah. You're right. It's, it's human nature. If I'm hearing you right, that you know, you're you're triggered. You can be triggered by something. But it's what's great is that the more we develop these skills in human relation and communication, um, you'll find that things that used to trigger either or used to be triggered by either by your children or your spouse, um, or your partner, um, won't trigger you the same way anymore. And the more I've done my training, like I can definitely look back at times where I think, wow, did that ever bother me? And I can be in the exact same situation now and it doesn't even really cross the radar, but I'll have a moment of like, I remember when I would have gone berserk over this situation. <laughs> um, and, and so it's a lot of that is because I've been able to work through something like this skill there's quite a few there's several but one of them uh, this skill uh, um, observation versus evaluation right anything else before we move on okay so a little bit more about so why it's important so it's an effective step in addressing challenges you're having with your child um, and it's to emotionally disengage from the situation by stepping out of your judgment mind. So in other words, what you're believing about the situation or your child uh, in the moment that you're triggered, what it, whatever it is you're believing, chances are is far more painful than the actual situation. Um, so for instance, some, some common triggering phrases you might hear in your mind is something like, he shouldn't you know, or she shouldn't, um, those ones are, you know, as soon as you hear something like that in your mind, you know, you're evaluating, um, you know, the situation that it shouldn't be the way it is. And not to say that, you know, the goal, the goal isn't to um, become okay with the situation and say, well, I guess I'll be a doormat, or I guess I, um, I'll just accept that this is the way my child is, or the situation is. It's not, that's not the goal. The goal is to get in a much calmer state of mind to take reaction sorry to respond to the situation rather than to react and when we're in evaluation mindset um we're will likely react to our child or the other per, or our spouse um in a less than loving way uh or effective way but when we can get out of evaluation head observe and then we're going to use some other, other skills we're going to talk about in a moment um, then we're likely to be able to respond in a much more loving and compassionate way. Okay, so the goal is to get out of reaction to like, get out of there right now, you know, and then, you know, do those like crazy, you know, parent moments that we um, uh, likely all can um, relate to. And instead, be able to take that deep breath, create space, observe rather than evaluate, so that we can respond rather than react. Okay, so let's keep going. 
So basically, this is another tool is self-awareness. So we feel, we start feeling far more empowered when we address a common myth. So here's a common myth that we have in our, in our culture. And some people get really uh, edgy and upset when I bring this up. So, so buckle up here, get ready. <laughs> Cause this might trigger you <laughs> just, just to be, uh, be prepared. Um, but here's a common myth that's embedded in our day-to-day -day language. And that is, you make me feel so, and then let's use mad, angry, frustrated. Um, we often can say to someone, you make me, you know, you made me so angry or you hurt me or you upset me or blah, 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 um, in a, some sort of negative feeling. My question is, is that true? And what we start to realize when we get more self-aware is we realize that yes, we have this emotion. So say, you know, our, our child has done something and, and now we're angry. Um, in the moment, we can believe that the child made us angry, but when we become more self-aware, when we start doing observation rather than judgment, we can start realizing that nobody can make us feel anything without our permission. We have the feeling we have because of what, how we've interpreted the event. And you know this because you and even say, if you are uh, parenting, um, if you're co-parenting, say there's, there's both of you that are, are, are parenting right now. And um, you can maybe relate to this. My husband and I can for sure. Our, one of our children could say something and I might have a very different feeling about it than, than he might, right? So we know that it's not the child's uh, words like let's say let's like take out like a triggering one that could really get a lot of people um the child yells i hate you okay so for a lot of people like i don't know about you but when i was a kid we weren't allowed to use the word hate like that was like swearing <laughs> right so um that that's a for me when i became a parent the first time my oldest child said i hate you i like you know uh, i just completely lost it right? My husband did not have that reaction, right? So if I, if, if I hate you is what makes somebody angry, then if that were true, everybody would be angry over that one sentence. Everybody would respond the same way, but we don't all respond the same way because we don't interpret it all the same way. We don't have the same stories in our head about it. We don't have the same judgments about it, right? So when we can start realizing that when we feel a certain way after somebody's words or behavior, that not from a place of blame, but from a place of self-empowerment, we can go, okay, so I'm feeling this way because, and you start going within to notice what's happening for you, what thoughts do you have around this, what thoughts, beliefs do you have around this, that's now causing the, the upset emotion. As long as we believe that someone else can hurt us or hurt our feelings, now we're, we're sort of double victimized, aren't we? We're, you know, the first thing is, is the mean words that were said. And now often if, if, we're, if we're really stuck into believing that, now the next, you know, sort of double victim is that you're looking for an apology usually. Usually you need them then to, to show remorse and say they're sorry. And not to say that that isn't um, a good thing for us to teach our children to do, uh, but it's so important to know that you, if you can own your own emotions um, and your own reactions, that's where you're self-empowered and you're no longer um, sort of a, a victim to other people's behavior, including your child. So your child can behave in a way and you can still be calm. Okay, it doesn't mean that you don't address the behavior, the unpleasant behavior, whatever, the unpleasant words or whatever but you're gonna be far more effective dealing with it from a place of calm than from a place of heated anger. Okay. All right. And again, interrupt me. So, so just to have this sort of written out more clearly. So unpleasant feelings like mad, upset, angry is a sign that there's a need we're trying to get met. And someone else's behavior can be a trigger to our emotions, but not the cause. Many of our triggers are also connected to our beliefs and perceptions of the event. 
Okay, so it's the way we're interpreting the event, right? So an example I give a lot, and this isn't a parenting example, but it's a parent child or it's an adult child example, is in teaching, um, because um, kids can say things that can be pretty triggering. Um, and one of my, with the, the moment that I, when I was taking training on this and learn and learn building up this skill, the moment I knew I got it was when I had a boy, when I was teaching uh, for several years, I did special ed and I would have children come to my room for extra support. And I had one uh, boy in grade four who was very angry most of the time. And uh, he had a, a background that would explain that anger um, for sure, a very troubling um, home life. Uh, but anyway, he came to uh, my room one day and he, he'd been coming you know frequently and just hated school hated doing school work definitely hated spelling and literacy work that i was doing with him um and he um he decided i had my room had a window ledge and a curtain um it's an older school at the time that i was at and he got in the window ledge and got behind the curtain you know and said you can't you can't make me do this and i and so i said you're right and, um, and then he was starting to get agitated that I wasn't doing sort of the typical sort of teacher response of like, listen here, young man, you sit down at this table and you're going to work, you know, instead I was like, you know, you're right. And then he's, you know, then he was starting to yell some more things and he was getting really frustrated. And then finally, um, he yelled behind the curtain, you are the worst teacher in the whole world. And I thought in the moment, I'm like, I just went into observation. Because I, I remember thinking when I used to always be an evaluation head, my my evaluation teacher head would say something like, listen here, young man, you cannot teach, you talk to me like that, you're going straight to the office, that is very rude, disrespectful, blah, 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 you know, and I just would have really uh, attacked back. And instead, when he said, Mrs. McPherson, you're the worst teacher in the world, I said to him, you could be right. And he just went completely silent and limp and then sort of slithered out behind, behind, the, behind the curtain, came and sat down beside me. Um, and, and then I just said, I, I understand you don't want to do the work. And I'm wondering if you're feeling um, frustrated because it's hard. And, you know, and he just let out a big sigh. You know, and we had such a connecting moment at that time because I recognized his feelings and his needs. Um, and so I didn't get into uh, taking his comments personally. I didn't allow him to hurt me. Um, if I did, that would be my business. But I didn't. I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to own this. And so just notice the power when we can stay in observation of not being triggered of not thinking he you know shouldn't shouldn't say that when we're both you know when we're in a calm state of mind and over time I started to tell get started to teach him strategies on how to be more effective in getting the help he needs and to not you know insult people when he's feeling you know inadequate and needing help it was a cry for help he just wasn't doing it in an effective way so I you know was able to work on developing his skills but I couldn't have offered him that if I was evaluating him and judging him and reacting and being angry to him. Any questions on that before we go on? Okay. So here's some quotes that I personally love to just remind myself of. Um, one is by Shakespeare. Nothing is neither good nor bad. Thinking makes it so. So again, just that reminding that we're constantly, um, you know, judging and becoming stressed over our own judgments about the situation, say particularly things, you know, triggered with COVID, um, rather than um, observing the situation. Um, and if anyone's so familiar with A Course in Miracles, um, that, that book was life-changing for me. And in lesson five, it says, I am never upset for the reason I think. And I have found this to be so true. When I'm excuse me, when I'm upset or triggered by something, when I go 
comment or the eye rolling or whatever the triggering event was, there's far more going on underneath um, for me. So here's another analogy I give when I'm doing my parenting workshop is about sunglasses analogy. So I always, um, and in fact, I have my, I think I have my sunglasses here that I use for my, yep, um, my analogy. I always say that when, however we're perceiving our world is through a lens of um, a beliefs, a life experiences, um, information, and this is how we interpret our world all the time. The more we can take a deep breath when we're triggered, um, and, and get curious and try to observe without evaluation. It's like taking the sunglasses off and seeing the situation in a whole new, brighter, lighter way. Right. So when I'm a supporting parents and they've done the workshop and they're used to this you know, terminology, sometimes I might say to them, are you ready to take a deep breath and take your sunglasses off? And, it, you know, if they're looking for relief in the situation, yeah, you know, they, they're, they're ready. Um, so otherwise, we'll just keep perceiving the situation through this filter. And this isn't about like bad or wrong or anything. Obviously, we're not going to judge this situation. This is just the human experience. That's why you and I could go to, say, a party um, or a meeting, a church meeting, <laughs> we probably all know what that's like. And one of, one of us could say, um, oh yeah, that was, that was great. Yeah. I've got lots done and you know, blah, blah, blah. And another person could say, well, who did she think she was just dominating the whole meeting and talking, blah, blah, you know, and someone else could be completely triggered in the same, about the same time and space. It's because we don't interpret our reality the same because we're not all wearing the same glasses. We don't have the same thing in our lenses. Okay, so again, this is about self-empowerment when we start to take time to look at what, what, what's in my lenses. How am I seeing the situation? Another analogy I give is the wild horse. Um, and if there's anything that COVID is doing for a lot of us, is forcing us to tame the wild horse in the mind. Some people also call it the monkey mind. Um, so it's when our thoughts get carried away and, and go wild. Um, and I always say that everybody has a mental health issue and your issue is training your thinking, right? So that's, that's your challenge. And if you don't get conscious on training your mind, you'll have a pretty wild horse. Um, and that's when, you know, we have things like insomnia, anxiety, um, seeking, you know, medication, that kind of thing, because the, the chatter, 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 um, or the, the upsetting thoughts keep you awake at night. Um, so I always say um, that when, you know, when people, you know, struggle or they're, they're anxious about something, um, I give the, the example of, you know, each, all of us get a horse and, it's our choice to decide what we do with the horse and we could put the horse in a corral and throw it some food and water once in a while and um you know but otherwise just leave it there and then wonder why you know we can't ride it why it won't come when we say come it won't stop when we say stop can't even get a saddle on it can't do anything it's just wild and out of control um and then someone else could get their horse and you know they they feed it nutritious food they tend to it they um, exercise it they train it they get a saddle on it they get it to do tricks it goes when it says go and stops when it says stop um, and that's the mind and so sometimes we can look at other people and say oh they're they're so lucky look at them with their horse they just they can do tricks and jumps and stops and you know all the stuff and my my horse is wild and out of control you know and well how much are you working at training your horse? Um, it is a, a, a choice we need to decide. As much as we need to take care of our physical bodies, we also need to work on skills to take care of our mental, um, or the horse, or, the, or some people call it the monkey mind in our head. So those are some other things that I, another analogy I give. So how is this helpful? Well, if we wanna be at peace with our children, peace starts within. Um, and it starts with having greater knowledge, greater skills, like communication skills, greater self-awareness, being aware of our internal dialogue, learning how to take off the sunglasses, and learning how to train the wild horse, 
And a lot of that we also do with self-care. So um, we'll be talking about that later, uh, the importance of um, self-care strategies. So just a note that it's far more um, effective um, to address our issues with our children after we've addressed what's really going on with ourselves. So when we do, our interactions and strategies will be much more effective and rewarding. We will improve our parent-child relationship rather than damage it. So back to the beginning when I was asking about ideal parent-child relationship or, or adult-child relationships, um, if we want to build things like you know, trust and respect um, and um, having fun together, enjoying each other's company, um, then it's important that we come to the relationship as our ideal or best selves, right? And I see this all the time, whether it's with parents or with teachers, you know, they're upset with a child behaving in a disrespectful and mean and, you know, angry way. And they're yelling their heads off and they're screaming at their other, you know, and they're like, they're so upset about their child behaving in this, don't you ever speak to me that way. And it's like, well, how are you doing with that? <laughs> how are you doing with managing your anger? How are you doing with staying respectful and peaceful and calm, right? So we really wanna make sure whatever we bring to the relationship is what we want in return. So we're gonna pause before I stop, talk about other skill sets. Uh, any questions at this point or um, scenarios where you wanna tell me an example and we apply it to an example. Okay. Well, again, interrupt me part way if you and at any time if you want to. We'll keep going. So another skill for the parenting toolbox is role modeling the golden rule. Okay. So in other words, are you treating and speaking to your children the way you would want to be treated or spoken to? So personal inventory is you know, do the rules you apply to your children also apply to yourself? Like uh, a bike helmet eating habits, drinking. Um, so for example, you know, I, I see this all the time, families going on bike rides, kids are wearing helmets, parents aren't, you know, and I just chuckle. I'm like, that's not gonna last too long because around the age of about eight or nine, they're gonna start saying, but I don't wanna wear my helmet. Um, but as long as you're wearing yours, um, then you can have teenagers wearing helmets because you're wearing yours. Um, you know, eating habits. If, is, is there rules in the house about what you can and can't eat, um, but then you turn around and, and break that rule, or, you know, you have to drink at a table, and then you turn around and take a glass into the dining room, into the living room or something. Um, so really, are you walking your talk? Are you doing that which you want them to do? Um, so before dealing with a challenging moment, stopping and ask yourself, how would you want to be treated in this situation? Um, so, you know, I think about, you know, if my child say is upset and we're out somewhere, you know, um, grocery store or, um, you know, when, when it wasn't COVID at someone else's house or something. And if they, you know, were in a situation, um, you know, where they were upset about something, you know, I, I would do, I would make sure that I spoke to them as privately as much as I could, because if I was upset about something, say, you know, I'm at, we're at somebody's house, you know, I wouldn't want my husband saying out loud, Jill, what's your problem? <laughs> you know, or just pull yourself together and stop that crying right now or whatever, you know, like I wouldn't want any public humiliation over my emotions. Um, so I definitely wouldn't, you know, speak that way to my child. So just taking note of, are you speaking to them? Are you treating them the way you would want to be treated? And, um, and also to keep in mind, like thinking about privately versus, you know, publicly too, is both situations, um, even, even at home, are you speaking to them, even when you're in the privacy of your own home, uh, the way that you would want to be spoken to, are you dealing with it the way, you know, for instance, they forget something at school, um, they forget their homework at school, or they forget something they were supposed to bring home, a lunch container or something at school. Um, if you forgot something at work, do you want your spouse to lecture you on the importance of remembering things um, that you need to 
think about how you're going to deal with the situation and sort of in a humiliating, disrespectful way? Or would you want your spouse to say, yeah, that's tough when you forget something? Right, so uh, really noticing um, how you're speaking um, to your children um, and, and treating them. Are you, are you doing what, how you would wanna be treated? Some, some, some other common examples just to do sort of a, you know, asking yourself when you're asking them to do chores, when you're asking them questions, um, how are you asking the tone uh, the content? Um, is it something that should be asked in private? And for teens in particular, do you really need to know? I mean, that's the one thing that older children get, the less they want you, uh, you know, prying too much, they want to be able to just, um, feel safe to, to share with you what they want but you and I both know that the older you get the more things that you don't want to sh necessarily share with with people in your lives um, some things become more private when asking questions are you giving them time to answer um, that's probably one of the greatest faults that adults do with children particularly young children they don't give them processing time they ask them a question they expect an answer right away and then there can be more stress and conflict when they bombard them with more questions rather than giving them time to to answer um, when you're speaking to them in public are you speaking quietly um, are you asking for their opinions and giving them choices in matters that involve them or their belongings um, are you dismissing their opinions or feelings especially in front of others or are you taking their you know their opinions in um, are you speaking in an embarrassing or patronizing way um, do you laugh at their concerns or worries? And I put here confession because this this used to be a strategy when when my kids were little, um, when they were when they were upset. Um, and again, this is one of those. I, I wrote a blog one time about we parent the way we were parented unless we choose otherwise. Um, that's our default mode is to parent the way we were parented. Um, and some of that might be great, and some of that maybe might be something we want to. Um, reevaluate. Um, and one of the strategies uh, that I experienced as a child is when I was upset um, to try to, to laugh at it, you know, try to get them to just laugh about it. Oh, it's no big deal. Sort of dismiss it and ha ha ha, let's just laugh about it instead. Um, and, uh, and now I realize how much um, that would often anger them even more because they felt um, invalidated or their, their thoughts or ideas were, you know, dismissed. And so I can look back and go, oh yeah, that wasn't, that wasn't helpful um, and, and still, you know, isn't to, to laugh over uh, their concerns or worries, even if in my world they might seem, you know, petty and insignificant in their world. Um, if they're upset, they're not making that up. It's, it's real for them. Um, and to um, so are you are you listening from a place of, of concern and validation and not being dismissive? So a, a life changing uh, a book for me and training has been uh, nonviolent communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, he has since passed, um, but when I discovered nonviolent communication not too many years ago, uh, maybe four or five years ago now. Um, my life significantly changed for the better, uh, particularly at school, because I use um, NBC uh, at school with my students all the time. Um, so this was sort of like, out of all the training, this was like the icing on the cake for me. And of course, I use it with my with my own kids and, and my husband as well. Um, so this is a picture of Marshall. And um, sorry that this is a little foggy picture, but um, one of his many quotes, he has many great ones, but one of them is, everything we do is in service of our needs. When this one concept is applied to our view of others, we'll see that we have no real enemies, that what the others do to us is the best possible thing they know to do to get their needs met. So one of the other things I had a, one of my great spiritual mentors um, said to me once that, uh, that we're either in a state of offering love or a cry for love. Um, and when we're in a negative emotion, um, Marsha would suggest that it's because we, we all have needs and we're trying to get a need met. And, um, and so there's, there's a sign or it's an indication that that um, there's a need that's trying to be met when somebody is in sort of an uh, unpleasant emotion or a state of, of attack. 
And when we can shift the way we perceive, you know, taking the sunglasses off, this is a great strategy on that. When anybody is upset um, or saying something mean towards you, whether it's a child or anybody, um, when we can apply the principles of nonviolent communication, what Marsha Rosenberg taught people, um, it again, it's, it comes back to nobody can hurt you without your permission. Um, it's very empowering. And in fact, because this is a church group, I'm going to just tell a little side, side one here. Um, I've been very involved in supporting um, our two-point charge churches while we have no minister. And because I've taken on a leadership role in supporting and doing some jobs that need to get done when there is no minister, um, I've been under attack. Uh, by some some members and I've received some um, painful words either to myself or, or to other people you know behind my back. Um, it's the teachings of Marshall Rosenberg that allows me to sleep peacefully every night um, because I can see that I have no real enemies. I just have people who are trying to get their needs met in the best possible way and this is how they're choosing to do it. This is sort of the, the best that they can do with their skill sets. Um, and so I can see them as Jesus invited us to, um, to see them, you know, still love thy neighbor, to see them with love and compassion, as I see them with, oh, so they're really struggling, and I wonder what need they're trying to get met, rather than taking it personally and thinking it's all about me, and how unfair that anybody speak to me that way, or say that about me. Um, I, I'm only going to be hurt if I allow, if I take that personally. Okay, so, <clears throat> Back to parenting, think of a specific incident uh, when you were having a challenging time with a child or a grandchild, um, maybe around mealtime, um, listening to a podcast or, sorry, um, you, sorry, I put listen to my podcast because I have um, different topics and one is about dealing with challenges with food. Um, bedtime, sibling conflict, screen time, kids, teens wanting to go out, um, you know, think of a, a, a triggering um, incident where you were challenged with a child. And then I want you to pick a word to describe how you were feeling in that moment. So I'm going to click on my feeling word here and I'm going to pull up a document. And this is um, what's in Marshall Rosenberg's book. He's got a list of feelings. Sorry, it's just opening here. Um, so he has in his book he has two and sorry it's i can't kind of get this all on the screen at one time um but he has a chart or a list of two groups of feelings so feelings that are known to be unpleasant and then feelings that you would call you know pleasant so under the categories of peaceful happy appreciative energized um, we're going to focus on these ones because this is usually what we're feeling if we're, you know, triggered an unpleasant feeling. So there's category, you know, basic categories of things under anger, scared, confused, tired, sad, um, and then quite a few feeling words. Um, when I took a, an online um, workshop series from an NBC trainer, um, she gave us a list and um, I keep this list. I have a list at school, I have a list at home. Um, and I just find that when I um, need to investigate a painful situation, I, I, I automatically go back to, to Marshall's um, stuff. So um, if, whether you're doing this for yourself or for somebody else, so in other words, if you're upset, you might go through the list and figure out what's, what's a word that I'm feeling. So again, I'm inviting you that if you think of a, of a triggering event, um, and you, you think about what was I feeling at that time? You know, were you feeling agitated or annoyed? Um, were you mad? Were you, you know, jealous? Were you uh, frustrated? Were you tired and burnt out? Were you sad? Were you disappointed? You know, so, um, so just keeping that list in mind, I'm gonna go back to the um, slideshow. And then when you think of what that word could be, you know, I'm just inviting you to have it in the back of your mind, and it can be any situation, this can apply not just with a child uh, situation in any situation. Um, and then in that moment, what were your needs? So I'm going to click on my needs list that Marshall includes in his book as well. So it's just going to take a moment to download here to show on my screen. 
So what he would say is if you're in an unpleasant feeling, it's because there's a need not being met and he has different categories. So it could be something around physical survival, tends to not be as much fortunately for, for most of us in this part of the world. Um, something around nurturing uh, in need of care or comfort or touch. Uh, there could be something around your sort of mental challenge, a need for information, clarity, understanding. Um, there could be something around autonomy. So that need for independence, a choice is a huge one for children. When, you know, if you see a, an angered child, choice is a huge one. Um, when they don't get choice, um, they will, they can be very triggered um, and they'll be, you know, can be quite oppositional to get the right to choose. We are seeing this right now with COVID. Look how many people are upset when the government has regulations. When you take away people's need for choice, um, they can get quite upset. Um, spiritual energy, there might be something lacking in that, in that area. A need for celebration. This one's huge for us too, right? A need for excitement, aliveness, play, um, Sometimes there's a, so interdependence. So in relation with others, there might be a need for acceptance or acknowledgement um, about something you've done, appreciation. You might you know, want someone to have some consideration or cooperation. Um, there might be a need that someone give you empathy or feeling of inclusion, intimacy, recognition, a shared understanding. Um, con contribution to the enrichment of life. So there's there could be lots. And then self-expression um, and integrity um, to one's own values, okay? Meaning, purpose. So there could be a lot, and there can be multiple ones happening at once. So again, it's um, very empowering when we take the time to notice what's um, happening for us. So, so you can start instead of, you know, when we're having an upset feeling, sometimes our autopilot mode is to be upset about being upset. It's about the, the next thing we do is we look around to see who we can blame. Um, a spouse is usually pretty handy. Uh, you know, somebody that we can go, oh, well, let's see, I'm feeling pretty bad right now. So it must be you. It's you. It's because you left your dishes in the sink. That's why, you know, and, and we keep wanting to look outward to figure out who we can blame for our painful feeling. Um, but unfortunately, then that makes us victims to somebody else's behavior or, you know, actions or words. And then we're now feeling now we can be very um, dependent on somebody else in order to feel better. The, the goal is to feel great no matter what anybody else is saying or doing. Okay. So, um, so when we can investigate our own feelings and now if you, if you're experiencing an upset feeling, you know, an unpleasant feeling then you can start getting curious and go, oh, wonder what my unmet need is in this situation. And the more that we know about that, then it allows us to figure out how can I get my needs met um, regardless of what's happening in my environment. Okay. And coming to a situation, particularly with parenting, just think of the difference you would be as a parent if you can feel that self-empowered to, to use your own feelings to investigate to, in ways to get your needs met, think of how you would approach the situation or even think about your own parent, how they would approach the situation if they took ownership for their feelings, recognized what their needs were, found ways to get them met and then approached and then parented you, right? How different the experience might be. So back to my slideshow, I'm going to go to the next one. So in nonviolent communication, what's really behind all this is about self-connection. So that's what I was just inviting you to do. Connect to yourself, have self-empathy, get grounded and take the sunglasses off to see, you know, and for me, the sunglasses off is, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to connect to it spiritually now. Um, that's when I have my prayer moment. That's when I have like, you know, you know, please God help me to see this in a new way. And, and that's when the sun, you know, the, literally I sort of feel like, you know, light comes into my mind and I, you know, and I get calm and peace comes over me and I suddenly see a piece of the puzzle, a piece of the situation that I didn't see before. And, and I'm like, oh, and then from that place of calmness, I can be the parent I want to be, uh, the teacher, the spouse, um, you know, the, the person that I want to be from that, from that place. 
So you connect with your feelings first. Do you have an unpleasant feeling? Okay, so what's your need or needs in the situation? And then when you get yourself grounded, now you can do that empathy for your child. You see your child in a negative feeling. Instead of, you shouldn't be feeling that way or stop that right now. I don't know about you, but I was raised with if I cry, you put those tears away or I'll give you something to cry about. You know, I wasn't allowed to feel what I want, what I was feeling. I had to shove it down. You know, best, my, my parents loved me and I love my parents. They, would, they did the best they could. And, and, and my, I know they parented the way they were parented. You know, and so, um, but that's how, that's how I dealt with. Meanwhile, now I know when I see my child upset, um, you know, the best thing I can do is get grounded myself and then get curious over, hmm, so I see my child is angry. My child is sad. My child is whatever emotion I see, what I observe, what I believe is happening. And then I can get curious and go, hmm, I wonder what's their unmet need in this situation. You know, and then when you're grounded, you can reach out to your child with compassion, okay? Um, with something like, it seems like you're feeling very frustrated and I'm wondering if you have a need to do that by yourself and you would like more time instead of me helping you. You know, you'll know you've got it because their whole body, just back to my, my student example, their whole body will just kind of like deflate because they'll be like, oh. and you see this, if you do this with your partner, with anybody, when you validate somebody's feelings, when you acknowledge their feelings, and then get curious over what's happening for them, um, you'll know you get it because they will complete, you'll know you guess wrong. If you guess wrong, they'll be like, no. And then there'll be some other kind of like, ah, kind of, you know, moment. And then, well, you can, you know, try again, or just even acknowledging their feelings is a huge way to deflate the situation, you know, immediately, because they'll, they'll immediately feel like, uh, you know, they see me, they hear me, they recognize, you know, they, I, I feel, I feel heard, I feel validated. Just like when you're upset, the last thing you would want is somebody to invalidate you and dismiss your feelings, or say you're making a big deal about it, or, you know, what, whatever, you know, dismissive comment there could be. Um, and that would actually just more up, upset you even more. Right? So, so we get compassionate with ourselves and then we get compassionate with the other person. So let's practice. So I came up with some examples and we're just going to walk through them. Okay. So what would happen if you saw your child or your grandchild say, hey, and this is the response you get. Anyone triggered? Oh, sorry, did I freeze? Sorry, I think I froze for a bit. Am I back? Yeah, you're back now, Joe. Okay, okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, so we could get triggered and say, listen here, young man, I worked hard to make you dinner. You're going to sit up at that table and eat it. We could do that and the fight would be on. Or we could take that deep breath, realize nobody can upset me without my permission. So I'm, you know, am I gonna to choose to be triggered by this? Or could I take a deep breath and get curious? What might he be feeling right now? What might he be needing? Okay, so what, what would you label the feeling here? Anyone wanna throw out a feeling? I think maybe he just doesn't maybe like what it looks like and he hasn't even tried it. Okay, so now let's, let's add, a, add a feeling word to it. So what might he be feeling? And I'm not, sorry, if you were taking my workshop right now, I would have already sent you the feelings and needs list and you'd have them in your hands. Um, and I can't kind of keep going back and forth through the screen. But any, anyone want to guess what he's feeling right now? Fear of the unknown. Yeah, so definitely there could be some fear. And on his face right now, uh, you know, I'm seeing anger. And just to give you a little, you know, side note, um, underneath anger is almost always, and I would say at least 99% of the time, is fear. Because fear is one of the most painful emotions that we ever experience. And if we ever feel fear, 
the, the way that we get out of it, sort of the next step up out of the fear gutter is anger. So we mask anger on top. So if you see or hear anybody being angry, one of the best little pieces of advice I'm gonna give you is get curious on what the fear is under the anger. What are they really scared, what are they really scared of? Okay. There's something, okay? So, but, you know, so we, ha there could be anger, there's the anger on his face and underneath, the, there's a guess that there could be fear. Yeah. And so what might he be needing? Maybe just encouragement to try, just to try a small bite and then, okay, if you don't like it, then you don't have to eat it. But I don't think forcing them is, is a good idea at all. I, we, I never did that with my kids and I don't want anybody telling me that, eat something I don't want to eat either. <laughs> yeah, way to go. That's right. That that came back to the respect thing we were talking about earlier, yeah. right? Is you but would give it a try. Give it a try. And then if you don't like it, then you don't have to eat it sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other ideas? What what might he be needing? So that what what um sorry I can't see names, but that other suggestion. Pat. Pat. <laughs> Pat, yeah. Pat offered a strategy um, and, and that's a, a, that is a common strategy to just say, well, try it. So that's great. Thanks, Pat. Um, back to the needs list. And again, I apologize because you don't have it in front of you. But thinking about the needs that I showed you earlier about, um, you know, self-expression, autonomy, in, interdependence, um, any, any of those come to mind on what he might be needing? I'd say autonomy and choice. Yeah, yeah, particularly choice. Like I remember I said, that's a real great go-to one uh, mm -hmm. when kids are upset, uh, not every time, but so much of the time. As a parent, as a teacher, um, I see children triggered by the lack of choice they have, um, especially at school. I mean, it, it breaks my heart sometimes because I won't, mm -hmm. don't get me started about school, but definitely there's times where I, where I just, get frustrated with a system that is set up that limits choice for for children um and so um of course they're they can be easily triggered when there isn't choice i can't think of any situation that i have put my children in um in in any recent years uh where there isn't a choice um i i refuse to that there you know is it so so for instance if they didn't like you know what was the food that was at the table then they could you know choose to get something else I personally and this is I don't when I uh, give parents advice or, or when they ask me for advice sorry my number one goal is just to get them in a calm state and help them take their sunglasses off and then I say how the strategies you use is up to you it's not my job to say what's right or wrong if they want to know what I have done or what, how I handle situation I'm going to I can answer that question but I don't say it from a place of um, what I did was right, so then you want to do that. Um, what I, my goal is just to simply help parents get into a calm, um, peaceful frame of mind and seek the clarity by taking the sunglasses off. And I trust that whatever they decide from there will be what's best for them and their children. Right, so it's not for me to tell you. So, um, so when I took my sunglasses off and didn't get triggered over this because I was triggered um, a little bit because again of my upbringing, um, you had to eat what was on your plate. There was ch starving children in Africa. Um, and for some reason that meant that I had to eat things on my plate that I didn't wanna eat. Um, so, so those things would, I would kind of get triggered and I would think, um, uh, you know, that, oh, I can't let my, my children away with this. And then I would, you know, get it. But when I took the deep breath and took the sunglasses off and I was like, oh, so there's a need for choice here. So then I would say, I'm only making one meal. And if this doesn't work for you, then you'll have to find something else. Um, but I'm not making it for you. You know, but some, some parents might make, um, multiple, you know, multiple things. Some parents might make sure that like, for instance, my children, when they were young, never liked cooked vegetables. So I always had raw vegetables and dip on the table. At like almost mm -hmm. every dinner, there was raw veggies and dip. Um, and, and so that's how I, you know, it was a preventative strategy too. They would eat raw mm -hmm. vegetables, cook them, forget it. Right. And so, uh, you know, that's how it goes. For a while, they went through stage where food couldn't touch each other. And so, you know, if I made a casserole, <laughs> that's a lot of touching. 
That's true. <laughs> and, and so there were times where, you know, when they were young, I avoided casseroles, right? Because they didn't want the food touching. Um, and, and so there's things like that where, again, respect comes into play. But ultimately, if they didn't like something I made, um, even if they didn't, if they didn't try it, okay, then you'll, you can, you can choose hunger, or you could choose to make yourself something, you know, there was always choices. Okay, yeah. so let's try another one. How am I doing for time, by the way? Okay. Um, here's another one. Uh, but me no want to go to bed. Me not tired. Peace, mommy. No bed. No bed. What's she feeling? No. Sad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. What's her need? The need to be with people rather than alone. A need for connection. Yeah. Could be. Yep. Need for touch. Um, need for understanding. Need to be heard. Maybe she's got some things she wants to still tell about her day or about um, what she's noticed and, and wants to talk about it. Need to be heard. So when we get from this place, then we can stay far more calm. Bedtime was, I put this one in because bedtime was a huge trigger for me when my children were small, uh, because I, I always say this quite, um, you know, sarcastically, is that I was blessed with four children that didn't need a lot of sleep. And so um, when everybody else was putting their kids to bed at seven, um, I have to tell you in the whole time I've had children, even from the time they were babies, right up to you know preschool, kindergarten, all those years, they were never, never asleep and in bed before nine o'clock. Um, and I would hear about moms that had their, bed, their kids to bed by seven. And I was so triggered over what was wrong with me that I couldn't get my kids to bed before nine o'clock. You know, and so this was this was huge for me. And um, I, I remember one time when my oldest was four and she came out of her room and it was like 930 at night and she had JK the next day. And I remember looking at the kitchen clock, seeing 930. And what was my mental dialogue? Um, you know, she should be in bed by now. What a terrible mom that I can't get my kids to bed by seven o'clock and 930 and she's still awake. What a terrible mom. And you know what, whatever we believe about ourselves, we will prove right. And in that moment, I yelled and screamed at her and I proved myself right. Right. But when I can start to take the deep breath and go, okay, I'm a terrible mom. Is that true? No, no, this is, this is not true. This is the situation. And then I can address my, my feelings and needs and then be able to get calm enough to be able to address her feelings and needs. Right? And letting go of the judgment that there's something wrong here. You know? So it's a combination. So I'm bringing in several of the skills here all at once that we've talked about tonight. Here's another one. Nobody even likes me at school. No one wants to hang out with me. They laugh at me behind my back. I have no friends. How's he feeling? Anyone just want to shout it out? He's feeling alone. He's scared. Yeah. Upset. Um, Upset. Okay. Yeah. He hurt. Yeah. Okay. Good. What might his needs be? Connection. Yeah. To talk to somebody. Yeah. yeah. Support. Yeah. Validation. Yes. Yes. And think of how many times um, an adult might respond with, oh, no, that's no big. Oh, come on. You know, oh, you're nice. Oh, people like you. Oh, you know, and, and tell him a different story than what he's saying. You know, believe them the first time. And then from a place of listening um, and validating, then they'll be open to seeing the situation differently. But if you try to tell a child what they're experiencing isn't true, they'll hold the story even tighter. Mm -hmm. Especially with ourselves. You think of it too. If you were like upset about a situation and your spouse dismissed it, tried to say, it's not that bad. It could be worse. 
Don't you just love that one? Oh, what could be worse? Oh, okay. So now I'm supposed to feel better because it could be worse. You know, it, that, that's very invalidating, right? So um, if we can just listen and acknowledge feelings and, and recognize needs, then they're going to be in a, then they get to the point where they're able to take the sunglasses off as well and start to see the situation in a different way. At first, they need some validation and, and empathy and compassion and understanding before they can do that. Here's another one. I don't even know why I would apply to college or university because I don't even care what I, I don't even know what I want to do with my life. I don't even care. I hate my life. What's she feeling? Insecure. Okay. Yeah. Despair. Okay. I'm certain. Right. Afraid of stepping into the world. Yeah, fear. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, huge. What might she be needing? Encouragement. A listening ear. Reassurance. Yeah. There might be, you know, lacking a sense of purpose in her life right now. Lacking a, um, a sense of connection, um, learning or mastery. There might be, she's lacking, she's in need of some meaning in her life or uh, mastery in her life, not feeling like she's able to um, sort of be good at something. And certainly during these times with COVID, I think a lot of people are having this fear when they go out to, because they can't go to really experience that growth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's right yeah yeah we've had to find new ways to meet that like like this mm -hmm. you know meeting over over zoom taking online courses doing school online um yeah so here's the thing i just want to add in here you might think okay so you acknowledge feelings and connect to their needs this is where self-empowerment comes when once we've had that opportunity to acknowledge either our own feelings and needs or somebody else's. The trap that we can fall into, particularly being loving, compassionate people that we are, and I'm guessing that that's true for you because you're here, is the trap we can easily fall into is then wanting to fix it. <laughs> okay? Now we want to like, oh, you, you're not, your need for mm -hmm. meaning and understanding. Well, you know what? If you just went and did, and if you just, maybe what you should do now is, you know, what I think you should do is, you know, and as much as that, um, sounds lovely my number one piece of advice i give whether it's for a parenting relationship or any relationship as unless somebody asks then don't offer because they can't hear you anyway right if somebody isn't asking you for advice over what should i do about this chances are they either won't hear you or they'll hear you incorrectly and be almost insulted by the advice so to speak Okay. So really uh, know that your job is to listen for the feelings and needs and hold space and trust that as you do this, it's like what, what we do for each other when we do this, it's like holding up a mirror and then you can, and it's like holding up a mirror to her and then she'll go, oh yeah. And she'll start to see and recognize her own feelings and needs because we held space for her and then she'll be able to start to take action from there. Okay, but often we need to do this where we need to find a safe place to vent our feelings. And when someone offers us that, that's when we can, that's when we have our moments of epiphany. That's when we, then our glasses come off. When someone can hold space for us and just listen and, and help to validate our feelings, that's when we can start to see there's light. There's, there's something I could do. Wait a second. I just got a great idea. Those great ideas often come when someone has held space for us. Okay. Let's try another one. Here's grandma. I'm glad I'm able to help out with the kids. Some days these kids wear me out. How much longer is this going to last? What's she feeling? Frustration. Yeah. 
She's expressing what happens as we age. It's just maybe tired. <laughs> yeah, tired. Tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What could her needs be? I think she needs to feel that she can be a grandma and not a caregiver. Yeah. So, and let's try, and I know you don't have the needs list in front, so in uh, front of you, but we should think about needs rather than, you know, guessing what she's thinking. Um, if we think about, is she, maybe, maybe she's in need for appreciation. Mm -hmm. Maybe she's in need for um, certainty. Maybe there's, there's a need for consideration, uh, communication. Maybe there's some communication by uh, um, breakdown between her and, you know, her adult children. There, you know, it could be lots going on, um, but really, sleep. pardon? Sleep. Sleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> In need of rest. Yeah. You know, she, maybe she needs a break. Maybe she's been doing this for weeks on end, you know, mm -hmm. um, helping with grandchildren and mm -hmm. needs some understanding. That maybe, maybe she needs to set her limits that, you know, I can't babysit every day, but I, maybe I can do Monday and Thursday or just to set her limits that she's capable of doing. Yeah, yeah. So she'll need some understanding around that from, from say the adult children that um, they'll have to make arrangements on some other days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll just do a couple more. Um, I am being told I need to do more, that I'm not doing my part. Then I try to help out and I'm told I'm doing it wrong. I'm not supposed to, to ask questions or complain. A word of thanks now and then would be nice. I'm just so fed up with all the yelling. What's he feeling? Underappreciated. Yep. So. Frustrated. Defeated too. Defeated, yeah. I was gonna say defeated, yeah. Defeated, defeated frustrated. Yeah. Exhaustion. Mm. I have a short story here to this effect. Sure. When my, when my girls were teenagers, I said to my husband, I'm so tired of being the one that does all the worrying about them. And he said, I have broad shoulders. I said, okay, but I'm just worried that you won't worry the right way. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a good laugh about that. <laughs> that, that. That reminds me of a podcast I just did with yeah. someone, um, with another, we were talking about sleep and, and um, some mother's lack of support around sleep and, and bedtime um, routine. And, and uh, one of the things that came up was the importance that if mom wants support, then they have to be open to the kind of, they'll get different support, that dad will never be able to do it the way mom does it um and yeah so they they can't even worry the way we do <laughs> like <laughs> no that's right i think women worry more than men for sure <laughs> yeah yeah and we equate worry with love right and that's mm -hmm. and that's the one thing that you know that when you start taking the sunglasses off you realize that you can love your children without worrying and that's mm -hmm. that's a, that's been a huge gift for me because i have to say that i i used to worry and now i I, I really can't connect to that much anymore. Um, so that's been a wonderful gift with learning things like nonviolent communication. Um, so what's he needing? He's needing a lot of love. Could be love. Validation. Yeah. Appreciation, mm -hmm. acknowledgement for what he is doing. More help, maybe he maybe he just needs more help doing what she, yeah he's doing. I don't know. Yeah, shared understanding. Maybe you know um, his wife isn't communicating clearly the help that she wants. Um, she's just frustrated when he doesn't know. Um, so some some clarity, some respect. Maybe spoken to in a in a respectful way. Mm -hmm some, you know, intimacy, connection. There could be, 
be lots, right? So, um, but what can happen is that when someone is upset, like our partner like this, we can get triggered um, with maybe a feeling of guilt and then not wanting to feel that feeling can then project back onto them and, you know, say something like, wow, welcome to my life. You think it's tough, you know, try being with them all day. Right. And instead, <laughs> think of what connection you would make if you could listen with feeling, listen to his feelings and acknowledge needs. Um, and here's the wonderful thing. When we can do this for others, then they are more likely to do it for us. It's very hard. Um, you know, if, if you want someone to feel to listen to your feelings and needs um, and acknowledge you know, what's happening for you, um, one of the best ways you can do that is do it for them first. And then they get their sunglasses off and they get in a calm place. And now they're able to, you know, much more able to do that for you. It takes skill though. So, you know, don't, don't think that suddenly they acquire the skill, but by you demonstrating it and role modeling it and, and offering it to them, they'll often, you know, pick up. Okay, here's our last one. I thought I was gonna love being a mom. Breastfeeding hurts, my whole body hurts. I don't think I ever want to have sex again. What's wrong with me? What's she feeling? Overwhelmed, maybe. Yeah. Overwhelmed with being a new mom and tired and guilt. Yeah. Shame. Yeah, painful stuff. What's she needing? needs a lot of support in any decision she makes. Yep, that's right, Penny. With encouragement. The, yeah, encouragement. Um, and I think validation that it doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there could be mm -hmm. lots going on for, for her right now. Yeah, a need for, mm -hmm. and, and even an, a need for some aliveness. Maybe she's sort of caught in a, a mundane, um, repetitive um, three hour cycle. That's just um, monotonous for her in this moment. Maybe she's in need of you know support, connection, right? So there could be lots. So notice how different we can respond to somebody when we connect to feelings and needs rather than back to our very first skill about judgment. We could judge and say something like, you think like, well, what's wrong with her? Get, get your act together, sweetheart. Like, welcome to motherhood, um, you know, or we can observe and then from our place of observation, we can start to get curious about feelings and needs. Okay, so, um, Oops, oh, sorry. Ah, oh, go back. I just have to move this. Well, so when we take the time to use unpleasant emotions in ourselves as red flags, as signs of an unmet need, um, then rather than creating anger and distance, instead we can build compassion and connection. Right. So back to you know children, why we're really here is if a child's experiencing an unpleasant feeling, we can you know, sort of argue with their feeling and argue with the situation, or we can use their unpleasant feeling as a red flag of there's an unmet need, what's going on here, identifying you know, there's an unpleasant feeling and then what's the unmet need and meeting them with compassion. And then how we respond to them will be far more effective than the reaction we would give them if we just judge their, the situation as wrong, they shouldn't be behaving this way or they shouldn't be feeling that way. And instead observe and remember respect and get curious over what could be um, their unmet need. Last thing I'm going to quickly, because I'm, I think we're running out of, we're talking, yeah, we're coming to the end here. Um, another tool is self-care. And I can't say this enough. If you're not taking care of yourself, you're not being able to be the parent or in, in some people's situation, the grandparent that you would want to be. Um, self-care is not selfish, it's essential. Um, your child wants a parent who is full with health and happiness, not empty and depleted and resentful. And of course, we all know the airplane analogy. Um, you are no good to them if you're passed out on the floor. You need to put on your mask first. 
um, and then you can take care of them. Um, role modeling self-care will not only benefit them directly, but immensely in their lives because chances are they will start a self-care routine. So my children, for example, will have been raised with a mom that has a morning self-care routine um, and chances are they'll do the same. I mean, they, I've seen it. I've, I've, saw, I've had two go off to post-secondary and they've done a great job at keeping a self-care routine, um, even in the midst of residence and, and different um, situations where, uh, you know, teens are more susceptible to uh, neglect self-care, if, especially if they've never been taught it or role modeled it, right? So they, the, um, they tend to make uh, healthy choices for themselves if it's been role modeled to them to do that. And so, um, whoops, back. One last thing. So find something that helps you to stay um, grounded and allows you to be the, the parent to your child that you wished you had or that you did have. And I, one of my little mo um, um, mantras that I have is I always say, one of my most important jobs is taking care of my children's mother. Uh, that's one of the, the, my top on my list is taking care of my mother. I always uh, tell people this because some, some moms when, you know, they, they can get you know really bogged down. Um, when at one point I had uh, four children, um, seven and a half years and younger, and in that time, even when they were that young, I never missed a shower. Um, you know, I, I just always prioritized self care. Uh, and people, some people would say I'd show up with four kids by myself. I, I showed up with my kids by myself a lot because my husband worked and we also run a farm. And um, I soon realized if I wanted to do stuff, I'd have to just pack up the kids and do it myself. Um, and so lots of times I would show up and people would be like, oh, your hair's washed and you're wearing makeup. My God, girl, how do you do it? Well, I have a self-care routine. And I always decided I would never let my children interfere with taking care of myself. Um, and they're grateful for that because um, now I've role modeled to them the importance of prioritizing self-care. All right, I know we've, we're up and in, in to the end of our time and including the question time, but any last questions before we, we end for the evening? Okay, so my invitation quickly to it for, I always do this in my workshops. I give sort of like, you know, invitation of things you can do moving forward. So again, notice when you get triggered by something your child says or does, as soon as possible, take that deep breath to create space, observe what you're saying in your head, just prior to your upset, during your upset and write it down if possible. Um, and I teach more about that in my workshops. Remember respect. Remember, unpleasant emotions is a sign of unmet needs. Remember self-care. And a gratitude practice, if you don't already have one, is a great way to train your brain, part of that training the wild horse, to focus on things that are going well. Um, and to uh, when we constantly work on um, focusing on what we're grateful for, um, things that did seem huge suddenly often don't seem, seem as huge. And my one little tidbit, my thing to remember is wait, um, especially if you have older kids or teens, remember this um, acronym, why am I talking? Um, I always say the older our children get, you need to talk less and listen more. Um, and so really make that a habit of um, trying to discipline yourself to listen, listen, listen far more than talking. And in the interest of time, you know, if anybody wants to share an appreciation, um, then that would be great. But otherwise, I'm also going to be asking um, if I can have your emails because I want to send a quick about four or five question uh, feedback form if it's okay and that's optional to fill out for me, but uh, just a, um, a little survey. And also, um, if you're okay with it, in um, adding um, your email to my uh, email list that go, my emails go out every other week um, with a with a new podcast and new information about a parenting workshop or, or something that I'm offering. Um, so any any maybe one or two appreciations of something that you got out of this evening. It's really good. Go ahead, Henny. I, I really enjoyed it. I, I think, you know, a lot of this 
for us older folks just refreshes a lot of our feelings and emotions. But um, I think we can always keep learning and that's what I enjoyed about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. I agree with you, Henny, You're very good. Yeah. Great, and, and what you'll you know, no. What is this that? The skills that I that I offer that I teach would apply to any relationship. Um, so yes. um, it's helpful not just with children, but with ourselves and, and with other people in our lives. So mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. Yeah. And during COVID, we have to have a lot of that. Yeah, that's right, Henny. <laughs> yes. It's yeah. been a test, hasn't it, eh? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. An ongoing test. <laughs> so when how do you want people to get their emails to you? Um, I think Elizabeth was going to email everyone to ask if she could forward okay. um, the group emails or the, the groups yeah. and just indicate if you don't want to, that's okay. Just let her know not to forward it to me, but otherwise she'll forward me the emails of everyone who registered. Okay, that's, good. that's, that's a good, good idea. idea. Yeah. yeah, and then also keep in mind too, if, if after a while you get emails and you don't um, want them, you can always unsubscribe. I never take that personally. You know, so, um, you know, you could go, oh, I don't know if this is, I need to be getting this or not. That's fine. You can unsubscribe. So, but I just Jill, wanna... did you share your email or have you already shared it? Sorry. That, I don't think I missed it, but then. Um, no, I can, I can put it in the chat box right now. Perfect. And I think, I think Elizabeth was going to also share it, but I'll just put it here right now for, uh, for people. Thank you. Um, Oh, whoops, that went to, I got to, that went to somebody else. I got to go back to the whole group. There, oh, did yeah. you see it in the chat oh, box there, now? I see it now, yeah. Great, so it's Jill McPherson, yes, at gmail.com. Any last things before we, we hang up for the evening? I really appreciate everybody joining me this evening. I want to take a moment just to say thank you for everything. And uh, certainly it's been very informative and it has met the needs of our group that we are trying to reach the community and support our young families. Great. Yeah. That's and lovely. older ones too, Henny. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. If there's anything, if there's anything we're learning right now, it takes a village, right? So we're yeah. all working together yeah. to support yeah. each other in uh, yeah. this no, challenge. Oh, really, ever really so much. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, I'll hang right. up and, and uh, if anybody needs that, please email me any questions. If you think of it, often it comes after, you know, something's over, we think of a question. So okay. please uh, email me if you have one. All right. Thank you, Joe. Thank, Thank you. Thanks Thank very you. Much. Bye. Bye-bye.